Well, it's now 1030, and that means it's time for Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. My name is Lawrence Diggs, and I will be your host today. Uh, this is an interactive program, and what that means is it's all about sharing ideas, uh, raising concern, asking questions, uh, brainstorming. That's what we do with brainstorming is throw around ideas and let the ideas wrestle, you know, and, and they can they can fight and wrestle. We don't have to. We just put the ideas out there and, and let them toss around. And then we get to observe those ideas almost as a third party, you know, just say, oh, well, oh, that's a thing. They're not a thing, you know, for you. Um, so that's the way this program works. And I say that because while we are... Um, speaking to our guest today and opening up, please be thinking about questions and concerns or ideas that you have relative to our subject today. Um, I think, Colby, did you put in our, our questions already? So if you look in the chat, uh, you can see that there are some questions that uh, might spark your interest if you don't have questions already. I'm, I'm going to guess that many of you or some of you anyway, have your questions already, or questions will come to mind. But as prompts, and maybe to help you listen uh, more intently or, or uh, critically to what we're talking about today, uh, you might want to take a look at those questions. We are going to be, you know, this is uh, Women's Month, and... Um, there are many issues or women's issues, but one of the things that we don't talk about enough is the contributions that women have made. And often we are unaware of those contributions because we have not been focused or taught to appreciate the things often that are most important. It's kind of like people don't have a lot of discussions about air until it's a problem with air, you know, and it's like fish probably don't discuss water a lot, you know, but we get used to things or we are, we're introduced to things in such a way that the important things to us are often overlooked. And today we're going to have a conversation about some of the uh, contributions historically women's ha women have made in the Black Hills specifically, but in South Dakota in general. Uh, and we have none other than Kelly Kirk, who is not only the director of the Sanford uh, Lab Homestake Visitor Center, but she is also a board member of the South Dakota Humanities Council. And she uh, has, she's a professor at uh, Black Hill State University, a history professor, and she's been studying the history of women's organizations and clubs in the Black Hills. And she's going to be talking to us today about some of those organizations and what kind of contributions they made, why they're important to us. And from that topic, we can launch into the general topic of women's contribution to our society and culture. So welcome, Kelly. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for, for joining um, and spending a little time with us. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to see all of you and to begin celebrating Women's History Month. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's always an exciting month every year. Um, and so uh, this topic, I have to say, I'm, I'm rather excited about, um, mostly because um, I I started researching a lot about women's history in studying the suffrage movement in South Dakota, uh, and particularly that in the Black Hills. I reside out in Spearfish and work in Mead. And so that very local story seemed very important. Um, but in looking at women's suffrage, I became incredibly uh, um, obvious that the, the role of different organizations um, you know, uh, were so key to suffrage success. Uh, and that uh, kind of led me down the rabbit hole of looking up the history of, of women's involvement in, in civic uh, organizations in their communities. Um, mm -hmm. 
I, I wanted before we get really launch into this, I like to have people have a better sense of who you are. Where did you come from? And, you know, where are you and where are you going? You know, who, who's <laughs> well, Kelly Kirk? <laughs> uh, so I'm originally from North Dakota. Um, mm -hmm. And then as I uh, did my undergrad at Black Hill State, went on to graduate school and came back and was able to teach um, local and Western history at Black Hill State University. Um, and then I recently moved up to the Sanford Lab Homestake Visitor Center in Lead. Um, it's this incredible place uh, where kind of history, science, and community all come together. Um, and so it's a great place of talk about place of history, uh, conducting, you know, history making scientific research. And so um, being able to live and research uh, in the Black Hills, it's just such a rich area to, to discuss and investigate. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the history of women's organizations and clubs in the back Black Hills. That's a, it's an effort or, or organization or tell us about what is that all about? So, you know, from kind of the very first groups of, of women who, who moved with their families, with their husbands uh, into places like the Black Hills, um, they, they began to gather. Um, and oftentimes it was um, women gathering with similar interests, um, gathering as a part of a church community, um, you know, kind of trying to develop maybe a, a ladies auxiliary um, to uh, a men's organization that already existed in a town like Deadwood. Um, but I think what's so interesting in, in, in the story is that it's so, it's so grassroots, right? Uh, two women get together and um, talk about how they, they read a book or they share a similar interest. They wonder if others in their community uh, feel the same way or would like to sit and discuss. An invitation is, is handed out um, over time, right? Um, you see kind of critical mass occur and all of a sudden they would like to form a, a more formal organization or give their meeting a name, maybe implement some rules or some procedures. Um, and many, no matter whether they started as a, a a literary society or um, an educational society. Um, many started uh, maybe kind of more on the like a place to gather and be together. Um, and then we see that they eventually um, all kind of take very active social roles in their communities. They get involved philanthropically. They um, uh, get involved in raising funds for something they feel is really important or supporting other things in their community. And that's a really neat history uh, to kind of see grow and develop over time. Mm. There seems to be some lost value in that and uh, unappreciated value in those kinds of clubs, not only historically, but presently. You know, we don't often recognize how much uh, local organizations contribute to the forming of our society. Uh, the values that we have, the ability to practice the ideals that we have. Can you talk a little bit about how those organizations influence who we are, or at least who we th think we are? Sure. You know, I think what's, um, I, I think that the story of many of these organizations, whether it's the, the Round Table Club of Deadwood, or the Thursday Club, or the Fortnightly Club, they, they, they kind of follow that similar track um, in the fact that um, it gives women a chance to um, gather and, and enhance their education informally. Um, and um, when uh, women were gathering and visiting um, and kind of diving into topics, um, they're developing networks, um, sharing ideas, um, growing, right, uh, organizing communication skill sets. And we see then uh, conversations occur about, you know, well, you know, um, we think that uh, literature is really important. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we helped fund, you know, getting different books into the public school system? Or wouldn't it be wonderful if we uh, started a circulating library in this small town to make sure that others could read the same you know, uh, kind of stories we enjoy or have more access 
uh, to a, a wider variety of literature. Um, and so you see that they maybe kind of begin looking at, at ways in which they can build and enhance their community um, uh, that, that they're in. And that that rather builds on itself over time, um, as you see so many uh, organizations kind of proliferate and they all take on, uh, you know, um, topics that are of really important to them, uh, the ways then that those uh, communities benefit more widely. Mm -hmm. So can you give us some examples of uh, some contributions those clubs have made. I mean, you mentioned like libraries and books and things like that, but I, somehow I feel like there's more gears into you know to what women are, are contributing and what those kind of organizations contribute. So I wonder if you could expand on that a bit. Of course. One of the things that I discovered in researching women's suffrage was that women's organizations were incredibly adept at fundraising. Uh, and whether it was uh, a, a congregation or a church organization um, or uh, a particular business or even a, a men's organization uh, in a community, they often went to the women's clubs and organizations and asked them if they would kind of take on uh, a fundraising goal or a fundraising task. Um, and so, you know, we see through newspaper reports kind of littered these stories of um, the, the women's clubs being the one to raise the money for a city park uh, and a new playground for the children. Um, women raising funds for a significant scholarship so that kids from a rural high school can attend college or a, a camp, um, that they are the ones who are raising funds to build uh, a new church building or bring in um, uh, you know, an organ into a community church, not just for that church's use, but then also right for um, other concerts or musical entertainment. Um, and of course, you know, as we uh, progress into the you know early 20th century, um, women's suffrage organizations were crucial, right, in helping push for things like women's suffrage, founding organizations like Girl Scouts uh, to, to create life skills. Um, and um, we see, uh, you know, women's groups specifically take on political um, things like getting women to serve on juries. Um, and so, or when during World War I, World War II, um, women's organizations gave up their regular work and their regular fundraising to focus on bond drives and raising supplies for troops overseas and supporting um, families of those whose family members were serving overseas. Mm -hmm. So one, we, those, are, those are great examples. And I'm thinking that a lot of times we, under, underestimate the value of other things that are underpinnings of our society. For example, uh, in, in conversation we had before, you mentioned the plague of loneliness. And I would think that that's, that's an important thing to deal with, not only historically, but to see how relevant that is to us today. How many of our problems really come down to people are lonely and they don't really know how to get together, you know, and, and do things together. Can you talk about the kinds of things that some of the organizations did to combat this plague of loneliness? Yeah, I, you know, one of the stories that, that really comes out, um, you know, in, uh, for example, the Round Table Club in Deadwood, first met in 1887, uh, officially. And they had talked as women about, um, you know, the the fact that um, being in a, you know, so far away from family, um, often being, you know, in a place maybe far different from, you know, where they had been um, kind of um, building a community, helping their families build a community uh, in, in the Black Hills, um, that to be able to gather, you know, even for an hour every other week or every week, provide an opportunity to, to kind of sit and share and connect. Um, 
to provide an avenue to talk about something other than maybe daily problems or daily issues, right? To, to focus on other things. Uh, um, and I, I always kind of go back to that story. Um, it wasn't that long ago. I thought I, I read an article about, you know, the U.S. Surgeon General talked about the um, impacts of loneliness um, on um, individual and community health. Um, and it just kind of made me think about um, how that has been something, right, that humans have, have struggled with historically and then have used um, gathering together um, in spaces to, to try and help, um, to kind of create, you know, find people of similar interests or who want to investigate similar things um, to kind of uh, further the sense of connection. And what we see women's groups do historically, you'll kind of see that a lot of their meetings move over time, right? When it's just a, maybe a group of three or four women, they might meet in someone's house um, and they'll rotate homes. Um, but as their organization grows, they also realize that for more women um, to be able to access uh, this group, this opportunity, that they need to move in sometimes a more public space. And so, um, Think about the role of public libraries, you'll even see early on, right, um, women um, meeting in a library meeting room or in a library um, so that people can feel like they can walk in, um, that they're not necessarily walking into a stranger's home, um, right, that could be kind of intimidating, but in this space that they're already familiar with and hopefully feel like they can kind of sit and stay a while and join that conversation. Um, and so that movement into kind of public spaces for greater access is a really interesting moment for a lot of organizations as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the impact of that though. You know, when we, when we, when we actually deal with loneliness, is there something you can say about how a society is impacted or influenced by having loneliness and then dealing with loneliness what 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 would be the difference? I think to some degree there's that sense of disconnectedness that then kind of permeates, right? Um, when uh, you read through historic newspapers in the hills, and there's these reports of women's monthly meetings and all that they're doing in the community. Um, you know that many of these women weren't just a member of one organization, right? That they they participated in multiple as time allowed or as interest allowed. Um, and I know when you research the suffrage movement, you'll see that women in these organizations, that's how they, they networked and connected uh, to help build the suffrage movement in, in not only South Dakota, but in many states. And so if you kind of apply that moving forward, you imagine that that sense of disconnectedness, right? Um, then becomes so much stronger when um, people aren't gathering um, in those ways and in those spaces. Um, you know, do you, do you feel a part of a larger community that you wanna be active and involved in? Um, do you uh, then feel like they're kind of that, that larger community that um, sees you making a home here and, and um, participating? So um, I think that's one of the, you know, uh, there's a lot of conversation, right, in uh, organizations today about trying to get people to to join and stay committed. That um, uh, contemporary life feels so busy, so overwhelming. Often, people don't have time to maybe give to an organization, um, and we see a lot of clubs and organizations really try and and kind of meet people where they're at. Um, that maybe if you can't give time right now, can you volunteer this one event that's a couple months in the future? Um, if you can't donate your time at this moment, um, can you do this in the background to help us prepare for something? Um, can you, uh, so kind of see um, organizations maybe kind of shift how they reach out to people and get people involved to try and recognize um, that uh, not only kind of that sense of business that pervades, but that people may not feel comfortable seeking out um, groups and organizations. If I'm understanding you right, we're really talking about the fact that humans are social animals and their competitive advantage in the animal world 
is their ability to to do things together and if they're disconnected then it diminishes their ability to 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 progress would that be a misstatement of what you're saying uh, i don't know if i uh uh, I thought that 30,000 foot view, but I think that it's one of those that um, humans are social creatures. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's a lot of research out there about how important it is to feel connected uh, to others um, and uh, how much richer uh, the tapestry of our lives are when we're connected um, to a variety of people. And um, I think that uh, loneliness and that sense, right, um, that maybe we can't find a place to do that or ways to connect um, really impedes that sense of well-being and that richness in our lives. Um, and I think that there, um, I don't know, the humanities particularly seems like it plays a really a special role um, in trying to overcome that. Okay. Well, I'd like to turn for a moment anyway, uh, more if we, if, if it's warranted, to our other esteemed panel members here and uh, see if they have any questions or comments, experiences, uh, reflections that they can add to this conversation. Well, Nikki? I'm never afraid to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been thinking, I, I I remember when I was very young and Gloria Steinemann first appeared. And uh, my husband at that time thought I was a women's lib. But now I'm going on 78 and I contemplate um, my role. And when you were speaking, I was thinking about often when men give women a job, it's something that men aren't oriented to do and a woman can do it better because she's more nurturing, that sort of thing. But lately I've been thinking more about uh, the differences between men and women. I know that we were talking about loneliness and usually women are the nurturers, that, that sort of thing. But I didn't know that we would ever be equal. We wouldn't have, uh, if you look at the news and you look at what's going on in Israel and Gaza, and uh, you just see men fighting and killing each other. And when you look at um, Ukraine and Russia, you see men in the streets picking up the rubble and the disaster. Uh, usually in the Middle East, when you see things, it's the, the men are, are picking up uh, what's left, trying to find, they're, they're, they're searchers for find, trying to find victims. So I think that our roles really haven't changed much. If you look at our government and uh, how it's run, when you look in the House or the Senate or whatever, it's m mainly men. So um, are we resigned to uh, this nurturing, um, solving the, the problems of children taking care of people who are lonely and need volunteers. Um, I know that it has changed. I'm old enough to see that it's changed. I've had jobs that were normally assigned to men. I, I know a little bit about that, but uh, I think that our roles really haven't changed much and I'm not sure that we can overcome that. We will never have an army of women we will never have a government full of women and the men are the minority. So we're just going to have to look at it for what it is. And we're assigned tasks. And when women gather, they, they gather differently than men gather. If you're in a room full of women that are having a board meeting, it's a little bit different than when the men are having a meeting. And I think the aggression um, and the muscle mass and everything will always set men aside from women and we'll have these different jobs. It's nice that we have Women's Day. I don't know when it started, but it wasn't in my lifetime. But that's all I have to say about trying to look at the division between men and women and how much we'll succeed or how much we won't succeed or we won't be able to overcome. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Sharon? 
You have to turn on your mic. Um, the first time I looked at a calendar and saw Black History Month, then Women's Month, then uh, Poetry Month, I knew there is concrete proof that once you get a month named for you, you are in the minority and you better watch out. But what Vicki says is true. You notice that uh, all of the, um, what is the guest's name again? I can't remember. Kelly, Kelly Clark. Kelly Clark. Kelly um, Kirk. Kirk. Kelly mentioned were from the ground up without any money. Mm -hmm. And the men seem to control the money. And maybe that's part of the aggression. This is so old. This is so ancient. The patriarchy got into control. And by gosh, they're not going to let go of it. So we have these nice things that women do. And they are really important. I mean, if you're out on the prairie, if you can get access to another woman and have some companionship and then another woman and you find out how this and this is done and then you get, gee, it'd be nice to have some books to read and all of those are really important, but there's no money behind them. Then you have to beg for the money. This is what makes me discouraged. Well, I have to say, I've actually lived in societies where that is not at all true. Uh, where if you, if it's very common to find that the men have actually no money in their pockets. And when they, when they go to a restaurant or something like that, they sign a thing and they sign a, a chit and their wives pay for it. Their wives control all of the money in the household. And not only do they, but they're expected to, and they're married for their ability to control the money and all the finances. And in their, their cultural basis, a superior man does not even touch money, you know? So okay. it's, <laughs> that's, it's, it's a different way to, you know, to look at it. So I don't, I'm not as pessimistic that, that women can't achieve, you know, some, you know, a, I I would say equality. It's not that they aren't equal, equal. It's just we have to recognize their contributions. It seems to me that that is the issue, not whether or not their contribution is valuable, but whether that, that contribution is recognized as valuable. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I know you're right, but um, I just was referring to maybe the majority of cases. Like mm. Taylor Swift has out, swift everybody as far as raising money in the entertainment world and there are corporations which are led by women um but if i'm if you're thinking back to the 1890s or or before that or after that uh, i think women had a difficult time yes and some of the women's organizations like uh, prohibition were not so smart, <laughs> but they got it through. They it was a good cause, but a lot of people like to drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, every cause is not successful, even if it's a good cause. You know, it, it takes it takes a while. But I'm just wondering too. You know, it, it does. Our men's roles a result of the expectation. For example, if you're expected to provide and protect. Doesn't that create a kind of mentality that almost pushes women to the curb, so to speak? You know, if that's if your role and you're expected to provide and protect, then you have a sense that you're supposed to get the money, keep the money, be in charge of the money. And if there's any violence to be administered, that's the one you're supposed to be the one to do it. And I'm wondering if, you know, if 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 it's possible to change the dynamics by changing men's roles as a way to change men's role, women's roles. I'm reading a book called The World, The Human Family. It has mm -hmm. over a thousand pages. I don't know if I'll ever finish it, but it starts mm -hmm. at 
50 BCE. Mm. And right away, it's not the women, the men, women expecting the men to take care of them. It's men fighting for power. It is just yeah. overwhelming. And you just want to, oh my God, how could people be so cruel? But um, so I agree with partly of what you're saying. Uh, I think that, I, I don't know, I'm talking too much. Over and out. <laughs> no, I, I think this is this is the kind of exchange you know that we we attend for these kind of conversations. It's like okay, that's a point of view. Here's another point of view. How do you handle that? So it's not really a matter of right or wrong, but seeing seeing an issue from as many points of view as possible, and uh, seeing how ma how many can we entertain. Vicky, you had seemed like you had something more to well. Add. The older I get, um, the more I see the separation. You know, you you would have you'd have to fight me before when I was younger, but I really think um, that we're built differently. It's obviously uh, you guys have more muscle mass as a rule, and I think it's hormonal also in the fact that we can give birth. Uh, I I don't know why the men have to do all the fighting. And I know in Israel, they do have women, young women, everybody goes out, you know. And there are a few matriarchal societies, but I, I believe that it's in the nature of men and women to be separated. I do think that men have more aggression. However, they always say if a war was fought by women, it'd be over in 24 hours, you know, as a joke. Um, but I, I, I do think, I think that we'll always be separated because of our, the way that we are built, hormonal, um, birth giving, um, and so forth. It's not that we can't do the job and it's not that we're not as smart. It's just that I, it has to do with muscle mass and aggression Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, anyone else have have uh, some comments or, or uh, questions, reflections? Well, I want to go back to the, the, the historical uh, uh, stories and uh, ideas that you've uncovered, Kelly. And can you tell us a little bit about historically what women's lives were like? Um, because I, I know I've heard at least stories of women who came out and they were single and sometimes they came and they worked together and they were handling all of those in air quotes, men's jobs, you know, from uh, uh, cattle to, you know, to plowing the fields. Can you tell us about what, give us some idea of what the daily lives of those women were like? I can try. Um, you know, the thing is, is that so often in, in history, um, it sometimes feels like we end up painting really broad brushstrokes um, because mm -hmm. we maybe don't have uh, the depth of detail um, to maybe give uh, the full richness of, of each person's story. Um, and so if we kind of take a, a 30,000 foot view um, uh, for, for women, um, for example, um, especially if we're talking about the Black Hills area, um, we see a lot of women coming west um, into the hills with their families um, and coming in to uh, support their husbands, right, business ventures, um, the the husbands uh you know wanting to resettle in the hills for the opportunities that existed there but we also have a lot of examples of women claiming mines um being the ones to have the the mines and the land in their name um if we kind of look at south dakota more broadly the amount of women homesteaders who are able to claim land under the homestead act uh, they make up a significant part of the story. Has anyone read Land of the Burnt Thigh? Um, uh, 
it is an excellent story of two sisters who uh, move out uh, into South Dakota. Um, and uh, the, the story about the community they find uh, in central South Dakota on the plains, um, what that community of homesteaders, how they help each other work together uh, to, to make community happen um, in a space that is kind of, you know, community non-friendly, right? There's much distance between properties, there is weather, there's daily work to kind of keep people apart. Um, and yet these sisters talk about a very rich kind of social life um, of moving from kind of homestead to homestead for different events. Um, one sister became a school teacher. Um, one of the sisters uh, started uh, the post office in the area, and she talked about how important that was um, for the community, right, to be able to kind of receive mail so, so close to home. Um, she ran uh, a newspaper business um, so that um, fellow homesteaders could kind of print out when uh, they were claiming their land. You had to have, right, kind of like first claim, second claim, this had to be published. Um, and so she provided that service. Um, and then eventually her and her sister even start a general store. And you want to talk about a place for gathering, um, you know, it's where things like the post office or the store is. And so um, it just provides, even though it's, it's one, you know, uh, one story of two sisters, I think it kind of highlights or gives the great sense of the, the very different roles and all of the different kinds of work um, that women performs on the plains um, as they moved west as, as homesteaders and home builders and community builders. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they talk about how the community came together to help each other. Sometimes I think homestead is painting as a very um, individual experience, right? This family moves out, they start their homestead, uh, that homestead succeeds or fails. But so often the community they were surrounded by plays a huge role, um, whether it's, you know, the barn raising, the quilt making, the coming together for uh, a life event um, that really makes, uh, yeah, that, that story very rich. And um, so uh, there's a couple other books like that, but I would say that Land of the Burnt Thigh is probably one of the, the one that really highlights all of the different roles that women fill um, uh, on the plains. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the stories that uh, I've experienced is a, kind of a corollary to what you were, you were just saying, Kelly, is I was doing this uh, promotion on uh, the Yellowstone Trail, which is Highway 12, Coast to Coast Highway 12. And I crossed the uh, South Dakota, into the South Dakota, uh, into South Dakota, just over the border. And there was a large restaurant. And when I went in there, um, there was a plaque on the wall that told the story of how this this building was originally built by some women who came together and they wanted to build a, a, a large, a, almost a boarding house or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the materials that they could get were, they didn't have a lot of stones and they didn't have stonemasons, but they did have railroad ties because there was, you know, and this building was still standing and they, you know, it, they had built it from railroad ties and cement. They used the railroad ties as uh, bricks. Partly the plaque kind of indicated that it was what they could handle as bricks and build rather rapid, rapidly because, you know, instead of doing three or four bricks, you put up one of those railroad ties and especially if you you know if it had a hole where you put the the spike through to the next um, to the next railroad tie, you could make a pretty sturdy building in pretty pretty short order, you know. Uh, so so that got me to thinking about how many other stories were there like that where women had you know gotten together and decided to you know even though they weren't married. You know, because you hear a lot of, well, you know, it's like if you're not married, you can't do it. But these women somehow manage. So that made me think, well, what other stories are we missing? What other examples of women doing what we thought that they couldn't do, even they thought that they couldn't do? Uh, how many stories 
are there like that? And if we knew those stories, how that would change women's idea of who they are, their identity. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that there are, I, unfortunately, I feel probably right that more of these stories have been lost to history than the ones that we know. Uh, but even in some of the, the women, right, who are very involved in a variety of organizations in, in Deadwood, for example, um, one before moving to Deadwood had run her own grocery company um, and had run a grocery store in her prior community. Um, we have the women doctors who moved west, right, to care for communities um, and be very active members. The number of women who came out as educators um, who uh, saw an opportunity um, to be financially independent uh, and, and kind of share uh, their passion, right, for, for future generations uh, in these communities. Um, and so there, there are a lot of kind of women uh, business owners, stenographers, right, um, who uh, a lot of women with certain specific professional skill sets. Um, for a while in Lee, South Dakota, um, the president of the Women's Suffrage Club actually owned her own photography studio and business. Um, and uh, she traveled from state to state and would set up shop for a few years, get very involved in those communities, and then kind of move to the next space with her photography business. And so, um, unfortunately, again, you know, these seem to be, um, you know, only the, the few stories or examples that you can find. Um, but it, it makes you imagine that if, you know, these are the stories that uh, are discoverable in newspapers and, and letters, um, that there are that many more, right, that we, we've kind of lost to history um, because someone didn't keep that paper or keep that letter um, or that name was never named. Um, mm. But there are quite the, the fantastic stories um, of what brought women to these communities and kind of the, the skill sets they brought with them, um, again, to kind of help build those communities and be very active in them. Mm -hmm. Sharon, you look like you were going to say something. I'm talking to Colby Lawrence. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll let you guys go along and complete I, that conversation. Um, I have a question. Since there's all women on here, except you and Colby, how do you guys feel or do you feel that things should balance out sort of 50-50 between men and women? And how would you go about doing that, the roles? Well, in my case, that was one of my um, high school challenges is that I was, I could say you, you could say I was angry that women were not considered equal. I was angry because we, if you walked into a group of women, suddenly you had to change your language. You were expected to open doors for them. You were expected to do all of these things. And they weren't expected to do things that you feel, okay, you can't you can't bench press four hundred pounds, but neither can I, you know. But you can do what you you can do. Why aren't you doing that? Why do we have to make differences for women? Why do we have to change our language or do all of these courtesies when I don't do that for men? You know, why do we have to have exceptions? So I started there. And then as, after I started to think about, okay, well, where did these roles come from? I realized that I grew up in a household where we didn't have those roles. I was expected to cook. One of my jobs was to do the laundry for the whole family on the weekend. Uh, there was no distinction about doing housework. Um, I didn't grow up with that. And so it was completely strange to me. I didn't know that men didn't cook until I was about 24 and I read it in the newspaper because I didn't know any men that didn't cook. My father cooked all of the men in my in my community, men in the church, they all cooked. I learned cooking mostly from my father. So the ideas that people talk about, they're just like fairy tales to me. So I, yeah, I believe that women Kobe? can be equal. Does Kobe get to talk? If you prompt him. <laughs> Can he talk? Is he allowed? Yeah, of course he is. <laughs> Sorry. 
Vicki, don't get jealous. It was purely a technical question. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, if he wants to, he can. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to to uh, forward the conversation to the future. And I think, you know, taking off of Vicky's uh, uh, question, what can we do so that more of these stories of women and their accomplishments aren't uh, in the dustbin of history? You know, because there are women who are doing some rather interesting and fantastic things today. And we are making history today. History is not just something that uh, people in the 1800s or 2000, uh, you know, years ago did or more. History is what we're doing today. We're making history moment by moment. So I would like to know what is it that what is it that we can do to to make sure or, or at least, you know, give a better chance to women women's contributions being appreciated as valuable. I feel well, like I have another a... question. Kelly, you yes. work for Stanford, right? Yep, the Stanford Underground Research Facility. Um, can you do anything through there, through the education system to get more girls involved? Uh, there are some really strong programs throughout the state that are doing wonderful work. Um, in fact, there's the, the Women in STEM conferences. Um, if you haven't seen these, um, one is hosted, I can only speak for the West River ones because um, they're what I'm familiar with, but look at what's happening at the like, School of Mines in Black Hill State. They're incredible um, experiences. And um, uh, so I... I really want to kind of yeah amplify some of those programs that are going on. They're they're really incredible. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? What what kind of things might we do to make sure that women's contributions are valued and uh, highlighted so that that you know I think it's kind of like an identity thing. I I I almost I don't know feel some kind of way, as you say, uh, when people think, well, I have to see someone who looks like me to do something, otherwise I can't do it. I mean, that to me, that's a bizarre concept, but it's real for a lot of people. You know, if they don't see somebody who, if they, if they don't see somebody called beautiful who doesn't have the same shape or face structure as they do, they feel they're not beautiful. You know, to me, that's a bizarre concept, but, I think that gets back to well, how do we how do we how do we put value on that? How do we how do we highlight that? Any ideas? Well, one thing uh, in any place West River East River that has a newspaper during Women's History Month, somebody could write up a piece about an unknown woman or one, uh, for example, which. The Kelly teaches about and um, put it in the paper. Some people will see it. Some libraries might even cut that out and put it on their board or say, you can find this article, click right here, wherever it is, L O do 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 da 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 da. Um, that's one thing, you using print. And also getting the names of these books out, Kelly, they're, they're really interesting. There was a book out, of course, I can't remember the name of it, about three or four years about women and voting, women yeah. of South Dakota and voting. Maybe you can, I thought that was a really interesting um, book and how, how in some towns, men really ganged up on the women. They didn't want them to vote. And mm -hmm. oh, anyway, but they succeeded. Mm -hmm. How about if men get involved in this process rather than women trying to break through? How about if men who make a lot of decisions about employment hire more women and not be afraid to what if it was mandatory that all people that were hired it had to be 
if mm -hmm. it was really truly equal. Or maybe no. that can't be, I don't know. But employment, certainly I'll bet with the mine, the percentage of men that are at the Sanford uh, facility are probably 80, 90%. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I would like to 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 ask how how would you suggest we go about doing that? I mean, it's not a, like a magic wand and just all the men change their minds. So, how do we get how do we get to 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 feel different about that? I think that uh, if a man is in charge of employment, he'll pick a man over a woman. Uh, no, I said say, how, do you, how do you, how do you get them to change their attitude so that they how do you would get do the men to change their attitude? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I do know that that men have an ego in this. Mm -hmm. I know that's part of it. And I don't even know that it's right to take that ego away. I don't know that it's right to say, look, you're really not in charge. We are. I don't know if that's a good deal or not. Maybe somebody has to be in charge and maybe it's men. I don't know at this point. It's looking that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not as quite as pessimistic. You know, I think we can. <laughs> I think we. I think we can. Uh, we can. We. You know, we can change, and we are changing. Uh, an example of that is it's not uncommon now to see men with their children. Where when I was growing up, it was like it was considered women's work. For most men, it's like, in fact, the courts almost said the children belong to the mother. In fact, in California until, you know, after I graduated from high school, if a father wanted to get his the, his, the medical records of his child from the school, even when he was like, they're married, living in the same house, he had to get permission from the mother, right? I mean, it's bizarre stuff like that that reinforces these identity issues. And so I'm wondering, how do we, you know, but now you can see men with strollers and sometimes two or three kids in tow in the grocery store shopping. I mean, I see it all the time. So I think not only things can change, but they are changing. Anyone else? No, you know, ideas we had how we could... last week. I'm sorry. Last week, the state librarian was on, hmm. so that some woman, for example, what I had suggested a little, do uh, article in the pa in a paper about any women woman that we might have overlooked, probably overlooked, so that somebody doesn't get stuck writing that somebody in the state library could get together a list of books about uh, women, South Dakota women, and and have that sent out to the state's libraries. And the, the local librarian could do with that whatever he, she, or they found uh, applicable. Well, um, that, a couple that, years ago. Go ahead, Sorry. Kelly. Oh, I was going to say, ahead. a couple of years ago, the um, State Historical Society sponsored the Her Vote, Her Voice um, program. And uh, they do you have, a, I think, a bibliography on there um, of some great resources, but also then um, people could nominate other people right, um, for recognition. And there are some incredible stories um, of women from history, but also women throughout South Dakota today who are just doing uh, incredible things in their community, in their state, in their country. Um, and so it's a great resource um, to kind of, if you're interested, uh, you want to hear more, um, it's one way, right, to kind of, uh, I don't know, maintain or tell um, these stories. I think that was one of the fun things about the Suffrage Centennial um, was that it was this great opportunity for uh, states to really look at their archives, at what was worth maybe some gaps in the history were, trying to um, highlight their collections, add to their collections, 
but even more so there was a focus on kind of um, preserving and retelling these stories. And there were a lot of other organizations or groups kind of like the Her Vote, Her Voice um, that then were able to collect stories of, of women today. Um, and I think, you know, when we're talking about, you know, continuing to, um, to, to see the change and to, um, you know, look to the future, um, there are a lot of kind of great ways uh, to get involved and some great stories out there that kind of, you know, show um, how these stories are being preserved and maintained so that, you know, historian 50, 70, 100 years from now can go back and see what was happening in, you know, South Dakota in 2024. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Any other ideas about how we can uh, bring to the forefront the contributions, valuable contributions that women are making to make their communities, our state, our country better for everybody? And I know that there are lots of them. Anybody else? Um, I, I'm i going to make this brief because I've talked so much. But, you know, I think even the everyday encouragement of girls to, let's say, go ice fishing with the guys on uh, Lake Oahe and uh, just getting out there like the this uh, young woman who is out uh, shot in basketball, more... Mm -hmm whatever they're called, <laughs> then even the <laughs> men <laughs> got more balls into the basket. And uh, just being out front encouraged girls not to hang back behind a, I don't know what. You know, I, I heard just... something the other day about boys and girls in uh, like elementary school that uh, the commentator said that with boys, uh, you have to let them out to run around to get their aggression out, but you don't have to with girls. It was what? like, yeah, that was, that was a story about an elementary school. Do not take, do not expect little boys to sit around in a desk and not burn mm. off that inherent energy they have that you must send them out, you know, at recess to to burn all that stuff off or they won't be able to concentrate. Mm -hmm. Nothing about little girls, it was just the boys. And I, I I don't know if that's true or not. That's that's what I'm thinking about with your testosterone. And are you guys really that different than us at Six and no. seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. No, I, I think we make that stuff up, you know, and because we want mm -hmm. to like, we want to reinforce whatever our, our, our stereotype is, you know, I mean, and I could tell you some, let's say, uh, graphic stories about things, ideas that, that people had about, you know, girls running at all, you know, I mean, so a lot of that stuff is just um, stuff we just make up, you know, but it, it just seems to me that a lot of this comes back to uh, identity and, and, and how you distinguish yourself as an individual, as a gender, as a whatever. We make up stuff so that we can say, I am, you know, and what am I if I am? And then we make up stuff and then we try to make the world support that idea. And if I were to look at one thing that we could do is stop shaming boys when girls do something better than they do. You know, for example, if, 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 a, if a boy and a girl are in a race, if the boy wins, everybody, okay, we expect it. If the girl wins, they shame the boy by, hey, you got beat by a girl, right? So that's really saying to the boy, that it's something terrible and shameful. And that gets folded in pretty early, mm -hmm. you know? So we end up having men who, having nothing to do with reality, think that it's something unusual and shameful to have a woman in front of them doing something better than they are. And so you have to create artificial barriers so that women don't 
appear better than you, you know? So that's one thing that I think we can do day by day to, to change people on a grassroots level. If we ask what, what can we do to help men to change? Well, it looks like it's 1130. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Kelly, for, for uh, stimulating this conversation. Um, is there is there anything is, that that people can do, or is that in this chat already? How they how they can uh, put wind in the sails of this effort? Uh, I was going to say I think that uh, Colby has shared a number of wonderful links. Um, I'm a you know forever educator, so I always say that. Um, the more that we can can learn um, and kind of dive into this material, um, the more that we can share stories and encourage people to share theirs, right? Um, make it a topic of conversation. Um, and I think that we'd all probably be a little amazed at um, what people are doing and what is happening in our communities and in our backyard. Um, and so, yes, if you haven't looked through the chat, there's some great links. Uh, thank you, Colby, for sharing this. Mm -hmm. This has been wonderful. We'll see you guys uh, next week. Same time, same station. Thanks again, Kelly, for all of your contributions. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody.